the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Welcome back to Titans of Nuclear. Today we continue our special series, Nuclear Nexus. If you're not caught up, Nuclear Nexus is a new series where we explore the intersection of nuclear energy's impact on a range of industries, um, particularly data centers. Our first series delves into that exact uh, synergy. And I'm joined by two great guests today, um, uh, someone that knows all things digital infrastructure and data center related, Bill Kleiman, um, and nuclear engineer and director at Idaho National Laboratory, Shannon bragg Sitton. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's great so, to be here. Uh, um, yeah, let's uh, uh, let's go in reverse order. Shannon, um, give us your brief intro and and uh, tell us about yourself. Yep. Thank you very much for that uh, brief introduction. As as was said, my name is Shannon Bragg Sitton. I work at Idaho National Laboratory, where I'm a division director for Integrated Energy and Storage Systems. What that means is I'm really looking to enhance how we use all of our clean energy sources. I'm a nuclear engineer by training, by discipline, and have worked across a number of different areas, really starting in the space nuclear world, looking at how we use nuclear technology as such an energy dense resource that also has no emissions to support a wide variety of applications in really remote regions. And we're trying to bring that back here to terrestrial applications to say, how do we use this really high energy density source of nuclear alongside renewables to support electricity applications, industrial heat applications, production of energy carriers like hydrogen that allow us to be really versatile in how we apply that clean energy in a number of different application areas. So within my division, we uh, develop a lot of those technologies that would couple with those clean energy sources. And I'm excited to talk today about data centers. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I think you just gave us the agenda for our next six mini series. So that was uh, <laughs> extra good for us. Um, Bill, uh, give us give us your intro. Sorry to make you go after that. I how do how do I compete with a nuclear scientist? i this is so challenging and also amazing. Shannon, that's I, I'm so excited. This is supposed to be my intro, right? I'm so excited to talk to you about all the things that you're working on because I think everything you said is absolutely fascinating. Um, Michael, thanks for having me on to this this webinar. I'm Bill Clayman. I am definitely usually this energized. This is pretty normal for me. Um, I've been in the industry for some time. Uh, I, I'm, I am a millennial, but I've been so fortunate that I, I haven't been adopted in this industry. Um, like Shannon, I have a, a network engineering degree. Well, not a new, not like Shannon with a nuclear degree. I, I'm saying like Shannon, I started off in the industry uh, very young as well. Working in like network closets and server rooms before they even call them data centers. Um, and I've been really fortunate to be in this industry for, for quite some time. Uh, right now, I am the CEO of Apollo, and we are the uh, infrastructure and AI infrastructure and AI platform company. And one of the things we really focus on has been this absolutely massive boom in artificial intelligence and what this means for the data center. And again, I know this is just an introduction, but there was this crazy statistic that recently NVIDIA shipped 900 tons of their H100 units. We're not even measuring them anymore in like numbers. We're measuring them in weight. And someone did the math on that that produces, if you put all of those in action, that's like 30 gigawatts of power that we do not have. 
So I'm fascinated in this conversation um, because, again, I've been in the data center space. I worked with Cloud Solutions, um, formerly uh, EVP of digital solutions of uh, Switch Data Centers, a fairly sizable data center organization that definitely focused on green renewable energy. Today, I'm also the program chair for the AFCOM Data Center World Conference, which is a flagship conference here in the United States, and contributing editor to Data Center Knowledge um, and a few other uh, really, really fun industry publications. And you know what? I think this is an amazing chat. I think we as an industry are experiencing a aha moment that we just don't have enough power for all this AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really um, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous growth curve, right? Um, it's fascinating that you're measuring it in weight. Um, so yeah, Shannon, like, does that, uh, that, your team is your work cut out for you, I think. Excellent. We're ready for the challenge. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, what, um, yeah, maybe Shannon talk through, like, what are the things that your team would look for? Hey, we know this, this is this, this massive demand signal. Um, yeah. What, what, what do you evaluate to figure out how nuclear can, can be a solution? So the first question I would ask is an individual center, how much power is, is really being pulled at any given time? How much electricity? How much cooling demand? Are there opportunities to look at utilization of waste heat to drive district cooling solutions where we can be really, really efficient in how we use that, that deployed energy source? Are we looking at solutions that leverage some of the new reactor technologies that are being developed and getting ready for deployment where we might be looking at megawatt scale systems, hundreds of megawatt scale, or are we up at that gigawatt scale for each and every data center? Those are some things that we, we can look at. Our suite of options available in nuclear are changing dramatically. So historically, if we look across the nuclear fleet today, we have large scale light water cooled systems. Those are on, on order of about a gigawatt of electricity per reactor unit. You might have multi-unit sites. But what we're moving into is an opportunity to right size nuclear for the application. So maybe we have a small data center. Maybe we have a really big data center. Uh, maybe we want to look at modular solutions such that we don't have one dedicated reactor to supply the electricity and cooling needs for that data center. But we want to have a suite of four or six so that we have even greater reliability and resilience. We have no downtime because we can shift the downtime for refueling and maintenance across the different modules. And we can add more modules as those demands continue to increase because I think it's only going to increase. It's only going up from here. So those are the types of questions I'd, I'd like to ask first and really understand, well, what kind of footprint do we have? How much space do we have? We're becoming more and more land constrained in many areas, many regions. And that's something we can take advantage of is this Energy density, as I said before, of nuclear is phenomenal. When we compare it to the other clean energy solutions, there almost isn't a comparison. But that doesn't mean it has to work in isolation. We can also look at, well, where is this data center? Does it have a good solar resource? Does it have a good wind resource? Well, let's take advantage of that too and couple the technologies in a way that best utilizes those resources and ensures reliable delivery of clean electricity, clean cooling technologies, so that we can keep you online. Yeah, a lot of great questions in there, Bill. Why, why don't you, maybe let's start with the size question and give us some of the history of how we went from a broom closet to a, you know, to multi-gigawatt deployments. I, oh my gosh, everything that Shannon has said, I'm, I'm trying to like jot down little notes here and there. Um, there's, there's so many things I want to expand upon from these large scale, you know, your traditional, you know, your, your, your steam stack kind of a facility to SMR, small modular reactors. We... I promise, Michael, I'm going to answer this question, but we in the data center industry, I want everyone to hear this, please, right? Get off your Amazon shopping list really quick. Just come, come listen to this conversation. This is, this is important. This, this shift that we're experiencing, it's not, it's not a technology shift. Follow me here for a second. It's a shift in, in humanity. This is not a fad. This is as much of a fad as, you know, when we stopped riding horses and started driving cars, as much of a fad as when we stopped taking trains and started flying through the skies. We as humanity have fundamentally shifted the way we interact with data. That's where all of this is coming from, where for the first time ever, we could ask a set of data 
a question and get a conscious answer back. Now, I use that word loosely. We're not talking Skynet here, but we're capable of getting a conscious answer back. That is so fundamentally different than ever before. We as people have been conditioned to work with, here's a search engine, Ask Jeeves, Yahoo, Alta Vista. If you're feeling feisty, maybe even Google, and you get a pretty blue link. You ask a question, you get a blue link. God forbid you end up on page two of Google, you're lost. You shouldn't be there anymore. Now, all of you listening, if you use Bing or Google and you've asked it a question anytime in the last month or so, that first answer you get is a generative AI response. It's not a blue link anymore. The blue links are a little bit further down. That's how quickly this shift has happened. Now, let's talk about scale and size. We as an industry have seen a massive shift in the last year and a half in terms of density, deployment, scale, the size of these deployments, and so on. When we started writing the AFCOM State of the Data Center report, we used to ask a question, what is your average rack density? And about eight years ago, it was about six kilowatts per rack. Now, the good news, that metric has more than doubled. The bad news, it's still not enough. We still need even more. When I was in Austin last year, and this is going to answer your question directly, and Shannon, you are going to like, your your nuclear mind is going to go everywhere, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> we, we we were sitting at this presentation, and JLL, who is a real estate company focusing on, on you know different sites and so on for facilities and data centers, they came up there and they got this chart. They got this chart of, of longevity of our data center uh, life cycle, right? How, how, how deals have been progressed. And for the longest time, everybody listening, we have been used to pizza box servers, right? And they really are just, you know, they look like pizza boxes. You throw them in a rack. They're like, you know, 500 watts, maybe a kilowatt or something like that. It, it's not much consumption. So we've gone from somebody coming in and saying, I need a plot of land with five megawatts or 10 megawatts or 20 megawatts. There was a day that I remember when a 30, 40, 50 megawatt opportunity, that's sizable, that's a large facility. On that board in Austin of last year, a single opportunity was 300 megawatts. That means one company came to JLL and said, I need land that has 300 megawatts of power. Now, if you want to think about how big that is, the African continent currently consumes about three to 400 megawatts total of data center capacity. India, officially the most populous country in the world, is in that four, maybe they're at a half a gigawatt capacity in terms of how much sizing. Now, in the United States, single opportunities are approaching 300 megawatts. And anecdotally, Shannon, this is where this conversation comes in. I post pulled aside by the JLL team and they're like, Bill, we're starting to get questions for 500 megawatts, upwards of a gigawatt in a single transaction size. That's that's extraordinary. That's th If you want to talk about going from server closets to do you have a gigawatt of available capacity, that's how much we've grown. Crazy. Um and and obviously there's constraints then on where you get that power from, which is the you know where, why we're having this conversation. So yeah, maybe um, <clears throat> Shannon walk through maybe the different sizes of nuclear facilities that are being talked about, right? To, because uh, like that's where there's a real. I, I feel mm -hmm. like it's almost poetic that nuclear started at a gigawatt and it's kind of coming down, and data centers started at ten megawatts and they're going up, and we're all meeting in the middle. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So. Really pick a number and I can point to a developer that's developing a concept at that scale, at that size. So I mentioned the megawatt scale. Those are micro reactors. Mm -hmm. uh, those are going to be non-water cooled reactors. Uh, they will be higher temperature reactors, a number of different cooling types and higher temperature gives us higher efficiency. So this is something that we really like to see. Uh, but we'll see megawatt scale systems that maybe go to a remote microgrid. Or we might see tens of megawatt scale systems that you deploy a few in a remote uh, remote village. Maybe you're going to deploy it within a, a military base. And then we get into some really interesting applications when we talk about small modular reactors. Uh, the overall limit to be called a small modular reactor is 300 megawatts electric per unit. So some of those might be 50 megawatts electric per unit, ranging up to that 300 mark. Uh, most of which would uh, be deployed in a multi-modular sense, maybe a four-pack, a six-pack, 
or even going up to a full 12 pack like the original new scale design, where you start looking like a large scale system getting closer to that megawatt or excuse me, gigawatt scale when we have all those modules operating. But what's really interesting about how these small modular reactors would then be deployed is you can get started with a few. And then as your data center grows, electricity demand grows, add another module. But we're already operating, we're already bringing in clean, reliable power once we've got one or even, you know, three, four units online, and then go up to that full deployment of that full scale system. And then we're starting to support that gigawatt scale data center that is out there on the horizon. But another really interesting aspect of these smaller scale systems is now we've got smaller components. We've got systems that can be built in more factories than what those really, really large scale components are, are requiring right now for the full gigawatt scale types of systems. So that means instead of a single source or a couple of sources globally for those large components, now we can have hundreds of facilities that can make those components. We can start moving through, building those components much more rapidly, getting to nth of a kind on those components. And they're also designed to allow for factory manufacturing and then shipment to site. Even at those 100 megawatt scale systems, we could put that unit on the back of a truck or on rail, bring it out to the site with site preparation already ongoing, getting all the, the site ready for that at a much lower scale than these really large scale single unit type of deployments and install it more rapidly. Because again, not only is electricity demand from sites like data centers growing, it's growing fast. So we need to start pushing through these factory manufacturing, almost like an automobile assembly line yeah. for these small scale systems, get them out to the site, support those energy demands, grow that supply as the demand grows. And now we have a really nice solution and it's clean. I, I love everything that you said, Shannon. And I think in your, in your statement, you briefly defined just how quickly we have evolved. I mean, literally people listening, mm -hmm. Shannon just talked about a prefabricated nuclear module and and that that she's not kidding at data center world this year last energy is like a kitty corner away from uh from where we're going to be doing our show and they're going to have a well there's not going to be any uranium in it but it, it's going to have one of their uh one of their nuclear little guys i think it's 20 megawatts and they, they correct me if i'm wrong it's one of their 20 megawatt units that's literally fits on the back of a truck uh, a semi they're going to you're going to walk through it and you're going to see how how impactful these systems are you know what 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 Shannon is talking about here the the actual the new scale SMR that's going to be built in Ohio and Pennsylvania it's going to be like 2 gigawatts of power by 2029 those that's that's for the data center community to use and and that's not even where we're where we're stopping on this in Virginia data center alley right we are actively running out of power and i think it's facetious that we're even considering firing up coal power plants to support advanced ai workloads that's not how this works we should be using advanced energy solutions to support advanced types of infrastructure and so one of the really cool things that we're seeing is there's an organization called green energy partners and they bought like 640 acres of land to build four to six smrs to support 20 to 30 data centers but wait also to create hydrogen to backfill the virginia grid to create an even more sustainable environment shannon said something really really important our infrastructure power infrastructure in the united states hasn't really been formally updated in the past, you know, but since like the 60s or 50s or 60s. And so now we have this incredible opportunity to develop a decentralized power infrastructure that's truly resilient and and not, not to throw politics into this, but there was a great scenario of where you learn where a decentralized architecture can support an entire population. And that was in Ukraine where they're like, hey, our stuff keeps getting hit and we keep going offline. What if we create distributed architecture to support it? And so they did. And therefore, they were able to be a lot more resilient. That's something that I think smaller, more compact nuclear solutions here in the United States can absolutely support, but also bring more clean energy to local communities, to more distributed environments. You don't have to be in a primary market to deploy your physical infrastructure. There are so many other wonderful options in this country.
Um, okay, it, amazing. There's a lot of different paths that we can take, but let's um, let's zero in on that delivery model, right? Like, what are we going to do to actually get these things in the ground from both sides? Like, uh, we, we don't we don't have it's an existential question, yeah. Michael. We don't have a choice. You know, Shannon said this earlier. I, I'm a big supporter of, of clean and renewable energy, but we can't re we know that there's going to be a load. We know the types of workloads that are going to be used. We can't rely on intermittent energy. We can't, right? It's it's a supplement, a complement, but not it's not we can't just completely rely on it. So what Shannon talked about earlier is yeah, creating sort of these microgrid kind of architectures that allow us to leverage wind and and solar, some of these more intermittent energy sources. The industry, our industry is actively looking at nuclear. That state of the data center report, we asked the question last year, how many of you are looking at nuclear power for your data center ecosystems? I'm looking at the report right now. Last year, it was 10%. This year, it more than doubled. Almost a quarter of respondents in our community said, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. We don't, we don't have any other options. We need clean energy. We need reliable, sustainable energy where it's we know we're going to get that load. So we have to start looking at things like nuclear. So it's an exciting time to capture what I feel, you know, I mean, what I feel is a phenomenal technology that is inherently going to help us resolve these core power issues that we're having. So let me build on something that Bill said, uh, talking about, you know, that paradigm of, of putting an intermittent resource to support a constant load or a relatively large constant load. Let's flip the paradigm. What we see as we go into this clean energy transition is we've seen a, a lot of um, energy markets that say, take the renewables when it's available, and that's great, but then curtail that clean baseload supply, like nuclear, when it's not needed, when we have ample renewables. Why don't we switch that paradigm supply the reliable, resilient power that's needed with that dispatchable power source like nuclear, add renewables where it makes sense. And then we will have energy that we can store and provide for peak power demands. But just flipping that paradigm around can potentially give us much uh, more reliable, resilient, and affordable solutions that better leverage those resources. So when I say storing that energy, when I'm what I mean by that is not just the traditional battery storage that we might think about. That has its own challenges. Storage duration becomes a challenge. Some of the materials going into that, but also thermal energy storage, store the energy in the form that it's created in. And nuclear energy is primarily a source of heat that we convert to electricity. And then also looking at chemical energy storage like hydrogen. And hydrogen has lots of buzz around it. It can be used for so many different things. And that's why there is such a buzz is because it's a very versatile energy carrier that can be produced when we have excess energy and then stored for peak power demand, or it can be used for a lot of other applications. Maybe you sell that hydrogen to a neighboring chemical facility, or maybe it's used to make synthetic fuels. So the transport systems to and from that data center can also be decarbonized. And we have to start thinking about that broader footprint. You mentioned also building infrastructure. Distributed energy systems where renewables have really had a sweet spot start looking very different when you bring in these small scale nuclear systems as well, because we can now build them where the demand is and minimize how much we have to build out and update transmission and distribution infrastructure, which is not inexpensive nor easy to do when we talk about crossing state lines. Mm -hmm. that we have to think about it very holistically and look at the solutions that fit the demand and growing demand in these very point locations. And we need to bring a resource that can support that at all times. Uh, Shannon, you bring up such a good point. A, a big part of our challenge in the industry was telecom fiber, right? Mm -hmm. you, you just you, Sometimes power is available, but communications wasn't. Well, that's not the case anymore, right? With dark fiber, with uh, more wireless communications and more of our communities being lit up, now the power has, the, the challenge has shifted to where, where can we get these, these power systems? And I, I think, I think you're, you're nailing it. And, and there's, I'm just excited to how quickly this shift has happened over the past mm -hmm. year, because it really is an existential question for a lot of data center operators. 
where they want to become a part of this market, deploying high density compute. I mean, everybody listening, we're moving from an industry that was used to operating at five, eight, 10 kW a rack. And now we're like, cool, now you got to be like 30, 40, 50, 60 kilowatts per rack to support these kinds of AI infrastructure. And it's scary. It's it's scary for an industry that I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, one of my mentors um, taught me this phrase, the data center industry loves innovation as long as it's 10 years old. <laughs> but, but we we don't have 10 years. We don't have 10 months even. You see how quickly this thing is moving. So we we have to take calculated risks. And this isn't like anything that's that's I was gonna say it's rocket science. Well, it's nuclear science, which is probably equally challenging. Um, <laughs> but it's nothing that's that's new, right? We've had nuclear technologies for for ages, right? And now we are creating these these modular systems that can be prefabbed, that can be delivered like a like a Dell computer, right, on a fab line. And, you know, you are capable of deploying these kinds of ecosystems in so many different kinds of locations and places, and they become a part of the community to support both community operations as well as uh, digital infrastructure. It's, it's such a massive shift, and I'm genuinely excited to see more energy and data center leaders actively looking at this as a real deployment option to deploy physical infrastructure. Yeah, maybe maybe go one step further on that. What how are you seeing like the procurement process evolve? Like like what what needs to happen in those data center organizations to actually execute on innovation that's not 10 years old um uh, to use your phrase and then and what does that mean for the nuclear audience that's listening, right? You've got a whole audience full of people that are dying to sell your industry power. How do we how do we bring those two together? It's it's a question of understanding the use cases. Uh, three years ago, when OpenAI, two years ago, let's say two, two and a half years ago, when we had OpenAI Gen 1 and Gen 2, that was like nothing. That's like asking a two-year-old a question and expecting a decent answer back. That's not going to work out very well. And so now we have this, this tool, this thing, this platform that's capable of communicating with us quite literally. And so, and so now you go back to the ultimate question. We, at my company, Apollo, while we do work very closely with the data center industry, we're actually being driven by data centers customers, right? Their enterprises are coming to us and they're saying, we want data locality, data proximity. We don't want information to be used to train big foundational models. But when they go to data center partners, traditional ones, and say, can you do this? Their answer is usually resounding, no, we don't have the density. We don't have the tool set or anything like that. What, what we've been doing is we'll put the software on top, we'll get the GPUs in order, but then it's getting that power and those resources and the architecture. As we take a look at the landscape moving forward, I'm not surprised when you start to see like green energy projects or those from new scale where it's nascent. It, it really is, right? This is pretty much the first time we've ever built nuclear facilities purpose built for my industry, for data centers. It really hasn't happened before. So the question becomes, and as a nuclear audience, you're listening to this, you're going to go to a data center partner and ask them a simple simple question. If you're going to be supporting AI architecture, where are you going to get the power? Are you going to be deploying it in you know Northern Virginia and London County or somewhere else in a secondary or a tertiary market that's quickly emerging as a great source to put physical infrastructure in. And once you start to talk dollars and cents, uh, literally kilowatt, you know, how much does it cost per kilowatt? You know, what does the deployment look like? What does it look like to actually put this in? And then you start to take a look at the government programs, the grants that are available, the existing um, uh, programs to facilitate and amplify your ability to deploy nuclear infrastructure. You realize, hey, there's a reason some of these people are doing this already. There's a reason that there's some SMR nuclear type organizations that are purpose built for the data center community. And you basically just need to ask them questions in their language. Like, how are you going to get 300 megawatts of power? Are you going to spin up coal? Is that what you're going to do? Because that's not a good idea. So adding to what, uh, what Bill has said, and, and going back to your first statement, understand the use cases. Mm. We as a nuclear industry shouldn't simply be pumping out products and say, here, this is great. We know you'll need it. We need to have that conversation to say, what do you need? What are your requirements? Is that huge demand for electricity constant? Does it vary significantly? 
on a week to week basis, on a seasonal basis? How does that really come together so that we can then look at those specific solutions that truly do meet that purpose and those purpose built systems can can be tuned to that actual demand. And I think we're getting there. We're having a lot of these conversations. The interest in nuclear energy is coming more and more from data centers, as you mentioned, Bill, but it's coming from industry. It's coming from communities because they're seeing that reliability potential and the fact that we've got some really aggressive goals for clean energy and we better be using everything we have in our toolbox to to get to the solution or we will not get to the solution. So there's some really great opportunities for engagement of the technical communities, but you also mentioned the community that it will be deployed in. Mm -hmm. And that is crucial, particularly when we're talking about nuclear-based projects, bringing them in from day one to talk about the option space, to talk about the technology space in a way that's understandable on the data center side and the nuclear side, because I work in nuclear. I don't know the details of AI. We've got to learn how to speak in the right language in a way that we understand one another and the community understands. And the community has to be a part of those decisions so that they have ownership in it. And they also need to understand how is this going to change the economy in my region? What kind of jobs are going to be available? Mm -hmm. How is this going to affect my family, my schools? All of these different pieces. And I think we have a really wonderful solution to put out there. So we need to start those conversations today so that we get to the right solution. Couldn't couldn't agree more, Shannon. Uh, I think there's it's a double edged sword, right? I'm sure we're going to get into this conversation, and, and as as we sort of broaden this topic out, working with communities, right? Even in the data center space, when we were originally deployed, this is why I, I said I worked in server closets and network rooms. We weren't even known as data centers. We were these nondescript warehouse like buildings in the middle of nowhere. And mm. people didn't want to know what was in it, and that that caused us a huge problem, right? Where I, I'm one of the younger executives in the industry. We have this aging talent gap that we're trying to to trying to overcome. But to your earlier point, yes, it, it is talking about the use cases. It is much more understanding what are you trying to deploy, what what new applications are there, and also including the community. We have the challenge, right? It's called NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. And when we start to overcome, no, not overcome. That's not the right word. When we start to listen with the intent of truly hearing our community members, we realize that a lot of their concerns, they just didn't realize that we've already been working on them, like not impacting the watershed, making sure that we're under 60 decibels as far as noise is concerned, making sure that we're not building buildings over a certain height to make sure we don't obscure you know, for example, Civil War battlefields. Uh, that's actually one of those that came up out in, in the East Coast. Um, but but a lot of these challenges are overcome. And I don't know if we have the time to get into nuclear safety. We can probably touch on it. Um, but that's part of the question that I'm gonna I get asked already. I'm I'm not a nuclear scientist. I'm gonna have Shannon on speed dial so she can help me answer some of these questions. But like Bill, where's the uranium gonna be stored? How is it gonna be secured? Who is going to be transporting it? Um, you know, and these are questions that community members are certainly asking. And, you know, we're capable of answering them right now. And this isn't like this isn't like enriched uranium. It's like 20 percent or less. It's not like you're not talking about, you know, and these the other thing that I have to kind of educate people. You know what I get often? And I hate to go on this tangent. You, you see the Ukraine symbol. People are like, I don't want another Chernobyl. I'm like, cool. Are we building them with graphite moderators? No, yeah. no, we're not building nuclear data centers like we did in the Soviet Union. Oh, my God. So, you know, I as a person, I was there. I was there in 1986. It was horrible. And I'm still one of the biggest proponents of nuclear energy because it's not going to happen again. So you touched on so many things. I don't want to just leave as <laughs> screens. But I think you've got your next 10 podcasts now uh, that we could dive into. So really quickly, nuclear safety. Number one, nuclear is the safest energy source by the numbers. We can go and look at all of that. It, it's incredibly safe. The challenge is the few incidents that have occurred have caused significant scares because people don't understand the technology. They don't understand what's happening. And that's why we do have such a need to communicate what these systems really are, what the challenges may be, what the operating parameters are. Advanced nuclear systems have adopted passive safety. Basically what I mean by that is 
the laws of physics, the fundamental laws of nature will shut that system down in the event of something off normal. We don't need a human interacting with that system to turn it off. Mm -hmm. Chernobyl was a very different reactor type. We don't build reactors like that. They've never been built in the West. And so that's not even a consideration. It simply cannot occur. So we introduce these types of approaches. We've been learning over many, many years and improving on what is already a very safe industry to make it even safer, even better. You mentioned NIMBY, uh, the not in my backyard. Frankly, when I'm thinking about an energy source, I don't mind a nuclear plant in my backyard because I know it's safe, I know it's secure, and I know that it's going to operate without emissions. And so when we start explaining some of these things, we get a lot of shifting in how these technologies are accepted. All technologies have a negative because it's a change from the norm. Doesn't matter what you're looking at, there is something different. And we have to think about what that is, what are we taking on? With this, you also mentioned where we're going to store fuels. How are we going to manage that? One thing I'll note about some of the advanced reactors: some of these systems can operate for an extremely long time frame without refueling. So right now, if I go look at a, a reactor that is operating on our grid, it's refueled every 18 to 24 months, and there's very good organization around that. That fuel handling is very secure as we move used fuel out of the reactor and put in new fuel, uh, then we can look at some of these other small scale systems. In some cases, those are designed that that core, that fuel loading will operate the entire time that that system is online. And maybe we go in every 10 years and swap out the entire core and take that core back for factory refurbishment and reutilization of some of that fuel. So we're changing that paradigm where we wouldn't necessarily even have any uranium either before it's gone in the reactor or after being stored anywhere near that site. So these are, are fundamental shifts in how we operate and we need to understand the concerns and address them and answer those questions and have the right answers. But we're looking at this in a very, very different way than we did in the sixties. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, eight, 10 hours of nuclear knowledge distilled into like 90 seconds, Bill. <clears throat> I, I, agree, I agree with you a hundred percent. Shan, I was just, I was just like in the back of my mind, I'm like, preach it. Uh, it, it is, it is a lot, it is a lot of education. It, it really, really is. And, and I wish, you know, I wish I could, I could support more of those conversations. A, a lot of time it's a fear, it's a fear-based response initially, right? Because they just don't quite understand, um, we're going to have to move past that very quickly. I, I know we're talking about this. What are your other options? I, and, and I hate to be this blunt about it, but in the data center community, here, I, one of the arguments that I get is this, and we're going to stop on this topic at least. is like, Bill, why, why, why not hydrogen fuel instead of, instead of nuclear fuel? I'm like, all right, cool. Well, how much does it cost for you to produce that, that one unit of, of hydrogen and actually deliver it to a data center? And then once you start doing those numbers, storing, producing, transporting, manufacturing, you're like, oh my God, this is really expensive. And my carbon footprint is actually way more than I thought it would be, even though my data center is using hydrogen. So in smaller use cases, amazing but when you start going to like the three four you're gonna produce 500 megawatts of hydrogen it's a lot it's a lot of hydrogen to make so the challenge becomes understanding well, what is your power source and it's not like any of this is going away as as the nuclear community that's listening to this we the end users the people in in the community in space these apps and phones and devices aren't going away ai is going to be integrated into everything and in the next five years Every data center is going to be an AI data center. It just all depends on how quickly they get there and how effectively they can find their power. The last thing that our industry wants to see is more fossil fuel generation for advanced workloads and infrastructure. A at least in my mind, there is no other great set of power resources than nuclear. And what I'm excited about is seeing people like Shannon and even our own government start to fund grants and programs for our industry to deploy these kinds of nuclear systems. That has been a massive shift. Everything from prefab to making them smaller, to making them modular, to making them much easier deployed. These are huge. These are, these are basically answers to a massive need in our market. 
Mm -hmm. So let me jump on something really quickly that Bill said on hydrogen. I think there's a misconception in in some of the general public that that don't work in this energy field that hydrogen is an energy source. It's not. It's an energy carrier. We have to produce it. It's very low density. It's not the easiest thing to ship. Uh, and there is a huge requirement for the energy associated with producing that hydrogen. There's been a lot of investment around uh, hydrogen hubs uh, that came out of the uh, budget language last year and is being invested now to look at clean hydrogen hubs. How do we make that hydrogen? How do we make it at scale? How do we get it to the end users? So it truly is just a carrier. And we've got to figure out how it's being made, where it's being made, and what are the transport costs. And you bring up a really good point. We tend to talk about energy resources and their emissions at the point of energy generation. We have got to look upstream and downstream, full life cycle of that energy production and those plants, mm -hmm. if we're going to truly understand the options available to us and how they may balance out for different applications and in different regions. I, I didn't learn that, what you just said, Shannon, until I did the math. And I was totally on that boat. I'm like, why are we doing nuclear instead of hydrogen? And then somebody sat down with me, much smarter than I, who's a power power generation. But let, let's break this down. And they they did the maths on it. And we did these calculations for a large-scale facility. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, all right. I, this makes sense, which is part of the reason why, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that that massive deployment out in Virginia on 641 acre site. I'm not saying they're going to be developing hydrogen to fuel the grid. Mm -hmm. They're going to be using the hydrogen to backfill it, right, to uh, add supportive architecture for power resource utilization. Um, you know, Shannon, everything you said is 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 really spot on. And I, again, I think a part of what our community needs is we just need to learn this stuff faster so we can adopt it more efficiently. You know, one question I have for you, Bill, that you didn't get into on your requirements for data centers is what is your requirement for reliability? I go talk to chemical plants and they need, you know, four nines, five nines of reliability. And for those not used to that type of language, we're talking 99.999% of the time they need electricity to be on. What is that reliability requirement for data centers? Great, great question. So there is the Uptime Institute's tiering model, right? There's tier one through four. Arguably, some of them can do, you know, some some have called themselves tier five. Some of them call themselves tier zero, which is more like workload level redundancy. Mm -hmm. And so each one of those tiers is really at the simplest level, a classification of a level of redundancy of what you can support in your environment, how many redundant systems you have, generators, everything else, and so on. So there are going to be facilities out there that are only going to require, for example, 99.95 uh, level uh, of redundancy, which is actually not that much. That's that's several hours of outages per year. Now, how, how can a data center possibly do that? Well, because a lot of workloads, applications, things are no longer hardware dependent. They're software dependent, right? So let's say Apollo, my company, is is doing AI model training for Michael, right? And all of a sudden, we we lose a facility. Well, for us, as long as that software status is is saved, we're capable of transferring it to a different site, which really only means like you have like 20, 30, 40 minutes of downtime or less, and you move the entire workload until that physical infrastructure comes back up. Now, that being said... There are other facilities that do require a much higher level of resiliency. Those all those nines, Shannon, that you had mentioned. Well, in those situations, the most optimal design is a redundant power feed, right? So you might have uh, a microgrid, for example, that has a natural gas connection to it, as well as you know coming in from a nuclear substation or a, a substation that's consuming power from a nuclear feed. So in those situations, if something happens and an environment goes down, you A, have a completely separate utility that's going to be coming in, or B, let's say you are in the middle of nowhere and you only have your SMR, your small medium, uh, small modular reactor uh, as your power source. Well, in those cases, listen, I'm not saying generators are going out of style, first of all. So you can have diesel generators running for quite some time, um, fully powering your ecosystem very quickly. And then the other thing is batteries. That stuff is coming along 
really quickly. We're talking like next level ceramic solid state battery technologies, which are infinitely faster to recharge, capable of handling big, big loads. Now, these aren't to replace generators. Let's just be very, very clear on that. They're there to store this power in case you need it for some kind of a burst capability or uh, a certain part of your environment. But to answer your question specifically, Shannon, um, it, it completely depends on the type of data center that you're building. But to be perfectly honest, even the most resilient level data centers, you could run on, uh, on, on an SMR and just have a good secondary backup feed, uh, like a generator, for example. And as long as you have good contracts to get your fuel, I mean, you can really run indefinitely until your primary power comes back on. Now, that being said, an SMR... You know, especially when it's, you know, being de delivered into a community business type environment, it's not going to go down for very long. I mean, the idea is to keep it running for as long as possible. I that, that that's the if, it, if there's an outage, it's it's minimal at best. So that's the point I wanted to draw. When we look across energy sources, I'm not going to give the percentages of the capacity factors for all those energy sources. But if we look fleet wide at the nuclear technologies in the United States operating today, keeping our grid running in many regions, they have a fleet-wide capacity factor of 92%. No other energy source comes close to that. So then when we start thinking about providing that power with maybe six different small modular reactors, you plan their fuel refueling outages and their maintenance outages to be non-coincident mm -hmm. so that you never have an outage due to those planned reasons. Can you have an incident where you have an unplanned outage? Of course you can, you can with any resource, but then you have much smaller scale amounts needed for that backup power. We don't have to overbuild like we would have to do in some of these other clean energy solutions and build it to the capacity needed, keeping in mind those planned outage cycles. So I do think there's a really good match when we start thinking about the dispatchability the reliability, the resilience under all weather conditions. Yes, we've heard of challenges associated with cold weather in places that don't usually get cold, like the Texas issues a couple of years ago, right. but those can be weatherized. Those are things that can be added to the system to ensure that that reliability and resilience continues. It's, it's an evolution. We're seeing power as a puzzle piece. And what Shannon said is brilliant because we don't have to overbuild. You can put an SMR in and then six months later, you can say, holy cow, we need more power. And you just put another module in. It, it is it is the most. And we're doing the same thing with data centers, by the way. These mm -hmm. large campuses, it's not just one giant building right there. For example, the one Compass data centers is building out in Red Oaks. It's a 400 megawatt site with 1040 megawatt halls. Right. So you and their buildings, 70 percent of a 40 megawatt hall is prefabricated. So you better believe that we're capable of doing similar things with SMRs. So in those situations, it's a puzzle piece, whether it's a facility for data centers or working with nuclear energy. That's the beauty of these kinds of advancements is they're small enough, they're um, they're effective enough and easy enough to get to these, these places that you can build power, nuclear power as a puzzle piece. Amazing. Um, I wanna be conscious of time. That's a great line. Any final thoughts from either of you? Really great conversation. I'll just say thank you for the opportunity. And I am really excited about the connection between our industries. I think it is a very good match. I think it's a really good opportunity. And building out these units at these growing and even more emerging data centers around the country and around the world will give us the opportunity that we need to deploy nuclear energy, to deploy these advanced nuclear energy systems, and to do it in a way that it's just one after the other so we can gain all the learnings of these technologies. When you build really large scale systems, it's hard to then gain those learnings and build the next one. But if we build smaller systems, deploy them much more rapidly, we can bring that learning curve into the costs for nuclear. We can drive the costs down, much like we've seen for the cost reductions in renewables and get to a sustainable solution that's very low cost and yet maintains reliability, resilience, sustainability. All of those other pieces of that giant puzzle where often one of them just doesn't fit. I I, I can't begin to express how much I appreciate, you know, Shannon, what you said. And and this this collaboration is only going to continue, you know, going to continue to grow, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. At Data Center World this year, we're going to have nuclear workshops. 
uh, we got Dr. Catherine Huff as our keynote speaker. And she is from the DOE and from INL. And she's a person who's brilliant in everything that is nuclear. Clearly, this is a topic that's so critical to our industry that we have to figure it out. And to have partners like Shannon and the Department of Energy and INL and all these other ones in between is paramount to our success, number one. Number two, it's to keep you connected. I mean, we we have to keep building it. It's not like we're doing this for fun. It's because you all are asking us to stay connected as much as possible. The one final thought uh, that I want to leave everybody here as, as you know, the nuclear community going out to talk to the data center industry. Um, the one thing that I would tell others is there's a lot of preconceived notions around nuclear power. And we talked about that, right? And it's a lot about education. So my big statement, and I'm going to quote Ted Lasso is be curious, not judgmental. It was actually a Walt Whitman statement that he pulled from there. And, and that's where you have to not judge something and ask questions about a piece of technology, right? Because you would be surprised. And from that note, from that note, once you start asking questions, execute on it. Really, please, please understand that you need to do this. Execution without vision is just hallucination, right? So we can have all these wonderful conversations all day long and you'll learn something. But unless you do something about it, you're just going to let this market pass you by. Grab a gold nugget, figure something out, go, you know, Go talk to your friendly neighborhood data center person and tell them how cool nuclear power is. And or me, you know, find me. I'm on LinkedIn and, and the internets. I'm out there as well. I'm a big champion of this stuff too. But my my biggest point is is don't let this stuff pass you by. Let's create an environment that uses cleaner, you know, better energy sources. Uh, and let's continue to support this crazy digital infrastructure that we all need. Love it. Let's go build it. Yeah. All right. That's a wonderful note to end on. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks so much, you guys. That was awesome. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.